time for some advice on how to approach the Unit 3 essay, what used to be called the content assignment, now it's called the essay assignment. Same idea, you're going to write a uh, short to medium length essay on the thing that I asked you to do. Now, just big caveat, the stuff that I'm talking about here is not going by any means into the, enough detail about any of the things I'm going to talk about, so if you only watch this video, that's not going to be very good for you. So what you should do to approach this topic is first, um, read the articles, watch the videos. Uh, not necessarily in that, art in that order. Um, for some people, that's the easier way to do it. For me, I always, when I was an underground, found that I didn't really understand anything that I was reading until I had kind of heard the lecture about it. So whatever order works for you, um, but just while you're, do while you're confused, just keep doing that. But more importantly, don't get stuck doing that because you need to just get started. You just need to start writing, putting things on paper, and get going. The more time you give yourself writing, the better, and the more opportunities you have to put the, the essay aside and come back to it, the better, because then you'll be seeing it with fresh eyes. You'll be kind of seeing it like another person would see it, and that helps you catch mistakes. Um, speaking of talking of other people catching mistakes, um, talking about it with someone, a friend, someone else in the class, um, even if you can corral a pet houseplant or, you know, worst case scenario of roommate, you know, buy them a six pack of beer, put them on the couch, tell them to remain quiet until you are done talking to them about the essay and then give them the beer. Do not give them the beer first. That will, then they will want to help and that will not be good. Anyways, that's all general advice. Let's talk a little more about Holly. So for Holly, the thing that you need to remember at, you know, no matter what we're talking about, is that the sort of ultimate principle, the ultimate justifier uh, for him is this idea of a, uh, I don't know why I did it this way, it's a, a mutually um, beneficial exchange, right? So remember the whole idea, also he calls this a voluntary exchange, but the whole idea is that um, the market system is presumably justifiable because it can satisfy people's needs, allow them to mutually benefit each other by engaging in market exchanges. If a salesperson is engaging in activities that undermine the possibility, the thing that makes the whole system okay, then that salesperson's not doing the right thing. So this is the ultimate thing to think about when it comes to Holly, right? All of the other stuff, the, um, the three conditions, the, the knowledge condition, uh, the non-compulsion one, and the rationality one. All of those are just ways of him trying to spell out how it is that we would go about ensuring that there's a decent shot at a mutually beneficial exchange. Okay, so. When I ask you, how is it that selling to customers and selling to businesses differ, your first thought should be, well, maybe in some ways the sort of conditions of a mutually beneficial exchange could be different if we're talking about the business to business case or the selling direct to the consumer case, right? So that's where your thinking should be. Um, and, you know, but don't just kind of stay there. You want to um, move to thinking about in detail how that might be playing out here. So you want to make sure, of course, like everything, you know, that you come up with some examples, right? Um, and really, this actually might be a good thing to do up front, because like I said, you know, with the just start writing advice, you also really don't want to get yourself too wedded to a particular thesis at the beginning because you know if you're working on it and you think oh okay here's how it's gonna go um, but then you're like oh there's this huge problem well what you want to do in that case is just keep what you have and just go back to the beginning and say instead of saying I'm gonna show this works just say I'm gonna show this doesn't work totally fine so you don't want to, you know, sort of nail yourself down at the beginning to like a particular answer, but you do want to commit yourself pretty early on, I think, to a couple of examples. So just give yourself a good, nice example that you can work with on the consumer side and a good, nice example that you can work on the business side, because that's going to sort of be, you know, the way that you're going to navigate this. Okay. So come up with some examples, make sure you spell them out. Don't have to take a lot of words, but just make sure it's clear to the reader what's going on. All right. 
So then you want to think about the knowledge condition, each of the conditions, and you know, sort of start thinking about how these things might uh, uh, be flexible. So remember that, it, for example, with the knowledge condition, right? He ends up saying that the information that you're supposed to give as a salesperson, you know, kind of your general obligation to the ordinary to the consumer, is to give um, sort of uh, something like what a reasonable customer uh, would need to know. Okay, and remember, he—I mean, he doesn't say this, but this is kind of my gloss on it, and I say it in the other lectures. You know, it's it's the who counts as the reasonable customer is going to depend. Um, I hope this is going to be in frame. Slowly getting better at these videos, but as you can see, not quite great at it yet. Um, the reasonable consumer is going to depend on uh, the like the industry. You know, and, and just the sort of, you know, the average customer, right? So, um, you know, the average person that walks in the door. So to use an example I've used, used elsewhere, if you're working at like a specialist, um, say, computer store that sells to people who do computer game, you know, computer gamers, right? They're going to come in with a whole bunch of background knowledge that you can't expect if you're just selling computers to somebody who walks in off the street. So again, it's going to depend on sort of who you're dealing with. And I hope you can already start to see that the average customer, right, in the consumer case might be a bit broader. So the things you're going to have to tell them to make sure you're doing your duty are going to be sort of, you know, a lot bigger. There's a lot more things you're going to need to make sure that the average consumer is aware of. But in a lot of cases, when you're selling to a business, if you're dealing with like a purchasing agent, they're the they're the people that wrote the spec, you know, for the request for you know bids or and proposals. So they are likely to have a lot of background knowledge. They're likely to probably even know more about their needs and about the kind of product they need than you do as the salesperson. So in that case, the realm of what you might what you need to make sure that they're aware of could be different. Okay, just pointing to one possibility possible way this could go. Again. What I want to see is you try to spell out the details of that. And, you know, as you go through that, I guarantee there are some possible problems that will probably come to mind. Um, try to say what they are. Try to solve them. If you can't solve them, that's fine, too. What I care about is that you are thinking these things through and trying to be, you know, as careful as you can and as open minded as you can to try to see like, OK, well, we could go this way, but this is going to have those problems or we could go that way. This is going to have those problems. That's what I'm looking for. I'm not looking for you to be right or anything, because the more important skill here to build is the ability to think these kind of things through. Um, Non-compulsion condition, uh, you could come up with similar things. Right? Remember, a agent, you know, in many cases when you're selling to a, a company, right, you're dealing with a purchasing agent who themselves has a manager and they have a manager. There are all sorts of internal company policies, so. What might count as compulsion, you know, uh, like pressure sales tactics in the consumer case that would not be OK because you, you know, in that case, you would be undermining the person who's basically the only decision maker. But if a company has all sorts of kind of internal checks and policies and a manager that has to sort of sign off on things, it might be more permissible to, to play a bit more hardball. Um, in, in the selling to the company case. Now, if you if you're going the way that I'm suggesting, um, you know, where the need to avoid compulsion is sort of alleviated somewhat by the fact that they have, you know, a manager and uh, policies and also they're not as susceptible to, to to pressure. Right. They're working for a company. They have the entire company's finances behind them they have a lot of other options in many cases. So those kind of things might diminish the amount of compulsion that, or sorry, diminish the what would count as unacceptable compulsion in the selling to the business case. Like I was saying, like I started to say though, if you go this direction, you wanna make sure that you say where the limits are still gonna lie, right? So for example, 
it would not be okay to kidnap the purchasing manager or the purchasing agent's cat and hold it hostage until you know she signs off on the deal, right? It would not be okay to go after somebody personally or any of those kind of threats. But the ordinary sales tactics that we might think are, are not okay in the consumer case, because it's just that one person making that decision right there on the spot, that might be different when it comes to this. Again, what I want you to do is think these kind of possibilities through and go with it, right? Same idea with the rationality condition. You're not just dealing with one person. Again, you're dealing with multiple people. So the sorts of things that might um, undermine a person's rationality in the customer case, or sort of the ordinary consumer case, might not be the same in the business case. So if you think of it as like, what do I as a salesperson need to make sure is going on with my customer in order for me to be ethical? Um, it's, you know, it's, it's kind of like if, if you're selling to, um, you know, like say an older person who might not be as cognitively able as a younger person, right? Um, in, if you're selling to that kind of person and you want to be ethical, you're going to have to really kind of make sure that you're really careful not to be sort of pressuring them or doing things that cause them to be irrational. Whereas maybe a younger person who has, who, you know, hasn't had sort of age related cognitive degeneration, uh, <coughs> that person, the younger person, you don't need to be as careful. And you could see that sort of same sort of thing applying in the business case. So those are the kinds of things that you want to think about. There's, I guarantee you a whole bunch of different things you can come up with here. Uh, be creative if you want. You can use any of the ones I just mentioned. As I said in the prompt, it's best to, you're gonna, well, as I said in the prompt, you're gonna need to make sure you cover all of these when you, ex the first part of the essay, which is explain, you know, sort of Holly's view. But then when you get to the, a plot, to the interpreting part, um, you can talk about problems that arise from multiples of the, multiple ones of these. Like you can probably see some of the same kind of things that came to mind for me um, as differences in, for these two conditions, the knowledge non-compulsion condition and the rationality condition. Those might, you know, are close enough together that you might wanna talk about the two conditions together. Whereas some of the things that apply to the knowledge condition don't, might not translate as well as to, as to those other two. And what you want is to be able to um, go into as much depth as possible, not cover just like, here's 20 different things. I don't want 20 different things. One thing done really well is much better than five things done less well. So hopefully that helps. This should be interesting. There's a lot of different ways to go. Just make sure you give yourself a really nice, solid foundation, explain what these things are up front, and you'll be good to go when you turn and when you turn to working through some examples, as long as you make sure that you just explain all, you know, all of the possible ways this could, could play out. All right, hope that helps.